to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we come. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, a 
another excellent opportunity to come before you. God, we praise you. We worship you. We magnify you. We lift you up, Father God. We say hallowed to your name, for you are worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. Now we come before you, Lord, asking you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk according to your will, walk in your purity. We thank you for forgiving us, and we ask you to bless us tonight to reap the benefits of forgiveness. We pray that you walk with us tonight and teach us from your word. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. To God's Hold on. Build your hopes on things eternal. Amen. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Again at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas. We are being promoted tonight to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we are tonight. Thank you so much for following through this book with us this far. And these are, these are coming to the final two chapters. These lessons are coming to the final two chapters of 1 Thessalonians. So we want to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 8 tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. That's the first pericope found in my Bible. It may section yours off somewhere else, but in my Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8 is the first, uh, first pericope in chapter 4. Apostle Paul is pleading with us. The Apostle Paul is beseeching us. The Apostle Paul is begging us. And the Apostle Paul is praying for us. And we look, as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, we find that Apostle Paul looks at situations as we see them today. He saw them in those days. Uh, he's dealing with sexual immorality. He's dealing with sexual impurities. He's dealing with sex of all nature. And it, it, it reminds us tonight that um, our sexual experiences, even though different, it's no better. Sexual sin on any level is sexual sin, and we have to be careful how we judge others. The Apostle Paul begins in chapter 4 by saying to us, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. He's saying, finally, brethren, this word finally doesn't mean that it's the last thing he's going to say. Now, of course, we know that he says much more after this. This word finally doesn't mean that it's the last thing he's going to say in 1 Thessalonians. Neither does this word finally mean that he's going to say the last thing now that he's going to say in the, in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Rather, this word finally means that I'm going to take a transition. I'm going to make another move. When we look at chapter 4 and chapter 5, we see a slight difference. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, the Apostle Paul approaches the church at Thessalonica from a mothering tone. He comes to us from a tone, and he even says it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 7. He said, I'm talking to you as a mother would nourish, a mother would have nature, a mother who would have the tendency to comfort her children. So in 1 Thessalonians chapters 1 through 3, he speaks to them as a nurturing mother, as a nurturing mother that would nurture her child, as a nursing mother, would nurse her child. He, he gives them instructions. He warns them against uh, evildoers. He warns them against uh, heresy. 
He warns them as a mother would say to her children, let me nourish you, let me nurture you, and let me nurse you. But in chapter four and chapter five, he takes on a daddy tone. He takes on a fatherly tone. He not just nourished them and said, come on, children, let's get this done. But he charges them. He tells them. He instructs them. And I say to you tonight, every now and then, the instructor, the teacher, the pastor has to challenge you. He has to charge you. He has to not only warn you, but just flat out tell you. So this is where the Apostle Paul is headed tonight. First Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, finally then, brethren, I urge you, I beseech you, I beg you. This word urge means I beseech you, I, I beg of you, I, I tell you. And then he finally says, I pray and exhort you. I, I, I tell you that I, I want you to know some things that, that is coming, but you have to do some things to make things right with the Lord. He says, I exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, that you should constantly be growing, that you should always do more and look for more in the Lord Jesus Christ. This word abound means, as I said to you last time, it's not only abound, but it's super abound. This word abound is the same word we get the word abundant, uh, excel and exceed. So we, uh, the apostle Paul wants them to excel in the Lord Jesus Christ to exceed what they've already gone through. He's given them a transition to go from being mothered to being fathered or daddied. I oftentimes use the same example uh, that the, the late uh, a pastor, a friend of mine used, and he said to us, he said a, a mother looks at child raising differently. The late Pastor E.K. Bailey tells the story, told the story about a little boy around the age of 10. And the daddy said, I want you to get out there and mow the yard. The mother came behind the daddy and the mother says, he's not strong enough to mow the yard. The daddy had the mother to know he doesn't mow the yard because he is strong. He mows the yard in order to get strong. You see, a mother looks at things from a nurturing, a nursing, and a nourishing standpoint. But here the Apostle Paul says, you must go from a nurturing or a nursing standpoint to an instruction standpoint, and you must abound. He, he says to them, you got to become a grown person sooner or later. In the Christian church today, we, we really need people to grow up. In the Christian church, we need people to abound more and more. We need people, and God is looking forward to people abounding more and more, getting to a point where stuff that used to bother you last year, year before last, five years ago, ought not bother you today. Boy, we got some folk in church that have not abound. Not even abound once, let alone abound more and more. I say to you today, saints, God looks forward to us abounding more and more. In other words, you ought to grow. You ought, it's time to grow up. And, and, and what you know now ought not be enough. What you gather now ought not be enough. You ought to always be searching for more and more and more from the Lord. He says you should abound more and more. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. You ought to abound more and more just as you've already learned. 
just as you've already heard, just as you've already received, you ought to abound more and more. You ought to abound more and more just as you have already walked that you please God. The goal is to please God. The question today, when you refuse to do what God would have you to do, or you refuse to do what leadership asks you to do, the question is today, are you pleasing God? When you are afraid to do some things, you know, it's impossible to please God without faith. When you're refusing to go to the next point, when you're refusing to do something you've never done, when you refuse to do something that you hate doing, the question is, are you pleasing yourself? Or are you pleasing God? It, it, it is amazing to me that people can say no so easily. And they throw temper tantrums so easily. And they walk off so easily. They quit in the midst of stuff so easily. The Apostle Paul says, you've received it. We know you've received it because you've received it from us. You've received instruction. I want to say to New Beginning Church, nearly 17 years, I know what you've received. And it's time that you ought to walk in it. You receive from us how you ought to walk. How you ought to walk. This word walk means that you ought to live. This word walk means that, that we have given you instructions. And these instructions are instructions as to how you ought to live. The word walk many times in biblical terms mean your conversation. In your conversation, here the word walk does not mean how you talk only, but it means your lifestyle, how you carry yourself. He says walk in to please God. You know how to do this. You know how to walk before the Lord. We have given you the commandments. You have walked these commandments. Now keep on walking in it. In to please, to please Almighty to please almighty God. Why are you here to please God? Why are you here to glorify God? Why you live the way you live? Because I want to please God. We ought not live the way we live to please mankind. We ought to live the way we live in order to please the Lord. Verse number two. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, through that Jesus, the Lord, through the Lord Jesus, through that one person, Jesus, the Lord. You know, you know the commandments we've given you. And because we've given you these commandments, you ought to walk in these commandments. We've given you these commandments through the Lord Jesus. In other words, these were not our words alone. These were words that came from Jesus. These commandments came from Jesus. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Through that Lord Jesus. Not the small letter, small L, Lord. When you type the word Lord and you're talking about Jesus, when you type the word Lord and you're talking about God, you always type that word or write that word with a large L. Whenever you're talking about God, the almighty, the living, the self-existing God, you always use a capital G. You, you want to always glorify him and give him his due because the God we serve, there's none like him. And because we are serving the only true and living God, there's only one God like him, so he's the only God that carries a capital G. And not only is he the only God that carries a capital G, Jesus Christ himself, our Lord, is the only Lord that carries a capital L. So when you're talking about God, when you're talking about Jesus, you ought to capitalize their titles or capitalize them when you're talking about them. It says, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Who is the Lord Jesus? He's the son of God. 
So he talks about God and pleasing him. Then he talks about the Lord Jesus, who is the, the son of God. And as he talk about the Lord Jesus, we understand that he's talking about the second person of the Trinity, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ himself. And in verse number eight, he talks about the third person in the Godhead, the third person of the Trinity, Trinity, the Holy Spirit, as some would say, the Holy Ghost. Verse three, for this is the will of God. What is the will of God? Your sanctification. He says, be careful how you walk. He says, keep these commandments that we've already given you so that you will please the Lord, so you will please God. And these commandments were given to you through Jesus Christ, through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3 says, for this is the will of God your salvation, your sanctification, rather, your sanctification. You see, salvation is when you become born again. Salvation has within it justification. When you are saved, you are justified. When you are saved, it's just as if you have never sinned. God doesn't hold it against you because you are saved. And when you are saved, it is known as, as, as salvation. When you are saved, it's not because of what you have done. It's because of what Jesus did on Calvary. What Jesus did when he got up early that third day morning. It's because Jesus died a voluntary death. Jesus died a voluntary death. You did not give your life for your sins. Jesus gave his life for your sins. That alone is salvation when we trust him to come into our lives. When we trust Jesus, his death, bearing resurrection, he became the satisfaction for our sins. God would not have been satisfied with an angel dying for our sins. God would not have been satisfied with another man dying for our sins. God would not be satisfied for our parents dying for our sin. Many times parents says, well, I, I would have died for them. I would have given my life for them. Let me just share with you, even if your parents die for you, there's no salvation in their death. It's, it only comes, as Paul says in verse two, through the Lord Jesus. Verse number three, he says, for this is the will of God your salvation, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. He says, now you have salvation, and once you have salvation, you will always have salvation. Once you are saved, you are always saved. Once you receive Jesus Christ, he's always there. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit always abides in you. You don't have to get in a prayer line. You don't have to go to a coliseum. You just need to trust Jesus. You don't even have to be in a church. You just need to understand the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection real well. And the fact of it, God makes it so simple. Understand the fact that Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose from the dead. And trust that story to get you to heaven. No other story can get you there other than this story. Once you trust that story, Jesus come into your heart. The, the Holy Spirit dwells within you from now on. You are saved. Tonight, Paul talks about, in verse number three, he talks about sanctification. So salvation brings on justification but then sanctification brings about holiness. Sanctification means that you have, you notice he said in the previous verses, walk in it. In other words, live in it, live the way that you ought to live, live the way that we taught you. That is sanctification. So salvation is a relationship. Sanctification is fellowship. Sanctification means that you ought to walk in him in such a way that you are holy. And I'm not talking about the holiness that, that you see 
people walk around here today talking about? I'm talking about holiness, walking before the Lord, being blessed by God because you're obeying him. The problem that I have observed, even as a boy, that there are those who say that they are sanctified, but they're only sanctified on Sunday. Matter of fact, they're not sanctified the whole day Sunday, just between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock. Just between 10 o'clock and 1.30. Sanctification is a consecrated life. This word sanctification means pure, purification or purity. Sanctification, sanctification means that you're walking in purity. Sanctification means that you're walking in holiness. And let me just stop right here and say to you is, say to you that your lipstick or a lack of lipstick does not make you holy. Lack of wearing pants does not even suggest to me that you're holy. When you are not wearing rouge or makeup, that is no indication of you being holy. Holiness comes from living for the Lord, living righteously, living according to, living in a way that pleases God through purity. So he says, we ought to be sanctified. You don't have to be a part of a sanctified church to be sanctified. If you're saved, you ought to be sanctified. This word sanctified means holy. This word sanctified means purity. This word sanctified or sanctification means purification. It means we're walking according to the, the privileges that God has given us, and we are saved, and we live like we're saved. There are three dimensions of a man. First of all, there's a natural man. The natural man is the way you were born. You were on your way to hell when you were born. You have no godliness. God just made you. Yeah, you are a child of God only because God made you. You are a natural man. You have not the Holy Spirit. You have not Jesus. You have not received him and invited him to your life. You are a natural man. And the Bible says, Paul says, do not expect the natural man to understand spiritual things. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Godly things are spiritually discerned. And if you are a natural man, a woman, a boy, a girl, if you have not received Jesus Christ, you are natural. And because you are natural, you cannot even talk about or live righteous because you love sin. Sin has a, a heyday with you. You're a natural man. And then there's what is known as a carnal man where you are saved, know that you are, folk know that you are, but you act like you're still natural. That's what Paul is warning them against tonight. He, Paul says, Walk as you are spiritual. So a carnal man, what he's saying to them, don't be carnal. Because a carnal man is saved. He's know that he's saved. He knows he's on his way to heaven. But for some reason or the other, he's acting like he's unsaved. He does what the unsaved does. And we'll talk about that a little later. And finally, the third dimension of a man is a spiritual man. A spiritual man is born again. He's born again. He knows he's born again. He act like he's born again. He lives like he's born again. Other people can see him as he's born again, and they view him as if he's born again. That is what is known as sanctification. He walks righteously and holy before God. Paul says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should, should abstain, abstain, from sexual immorality. Don't turn me off yet. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. This phrase, sexual immorality, is the same Greek word we get the word pornography. It is not only what we do with our bodies, but it's what we let go through our bodies. It's what we see. It's what we desire. It is our lust. You see, some people think that they're good because they can do it in the back, in the dark. But Paul says, abstain, move around, don't do it. He says, abstain 
from sexual immorality. This word, this phrase sexual immorality means to abstain from pornography, abstain from fornication, abstain from, from adultery, abstain from incest, abstain from homosexuality, abstain from bestiality, abstain from lesbian activity, even the lust of our flesh abstain from it when it comes to sexual activity. Look at what it says, abstain from sexual immorality that each of you should know how to possess your own or his own vessel in sanctification and in honor. God is honored when we abstain from sexual immorality, God gets the honor. And others see that we are sanctified. Others see that we are sanctified. But more importantly, God knows that we are walking in sanctification. And guess what? God is honored. He says, know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. He said, know how to possess it. Know how to carry yourself. What Paul is saying, as he said in other places in, in the New Testament, he's saying your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, be sanctified even in your sexual thoughts, even in your sexual actions. He says, abstain and carry yourself possess your own body as a vessel unto the Lord in sanctification and in honor. Verse number five, not in passions of lust, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. He says, don't give way to the passion of lust. He said, don't, don't carry yourself in these passions of lust. He says, don't, don't carry your, yourself in a way like the Gentiles do. I told you from the start, the Gentiles was having all kinds of sex. He talks about the fact that these Gentiles are those who are ungodly. He says, you're no longer ungodly. You're no longer in the group that is, is not pure. You see, the Jews would have the Gentiles to think that they are not pure enough. Uh, they are of a race that is not a pure race. Paul takes us a step farther here, and he says to us tonight, regardless of the race you are part of, you make sure you are part of the God race. And as you are a part of the God's race, of, of the race of God, you are no longer a Gentile. You are no longer a foreigner. <laughs> he said you are no longer a pagan. So when Paul uses this word Gentile, he talks about foreigners. He talks about pagans. He's talking about the unsaved and unrighteous. He says to them, those of you at the church of Thessalonica, whatever you do, don't act like them. He's saying to them is that make sure you are sanctified, set apart, holy, and stop acting like those who are not holy. And he deals with sexual immorality. And I know in the church today, we don't, we don't talk about it enough. And, and we, somebody's listening to me tonight saying, I need to take the children out of this room because Pastor David's talking about this and we don't need to talk. Let me tell you, your child knows more about sex than you do. Hello. And the fact of the matter is, you don't want me to be one of those feel-good preachers that just skip over the text, do you? Is in the text. I didn't have to go looking for it. I didn't have to go on Facebook for it. I didn't have to go to, to the internet for it. It's right there in the text. He says, don't be controlled by your, by your passions of lust. Don't be controlled by that, that desire that you have. Don't be controlled. Like the Gentiles who do not know God. In other words, act like you know God. And work like you know God. Let me tell you, even on your job, you ought to make sure that you work like you know God. People ought to know you know God without you telling them you know God. 
your, your friends, your neighbors ought to know that is the God house over there. And you don't have to tell them. You don't have to come out in your seat, in your suit, your dress, your high heels. You don't have to get a seat that says, and a step that says, hey, I'm a Christian. You don't have to wear a hat that says, I love Jesus. They ought to know you, love, you know God and you love God based on how you live your life. We are living testimony. The only thing we have is our integrity. The only thing we need is God. Walk with him. Stay with him. Now, having said all of this, I want to confess tonight I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. Just as guilty as you are. So you can run and tell that. I'm guilty as charged. I have lived a life like the Gentiles, even though I was saved. But let me just share with you, I knew who to run to and I ran there. I knew who to go to, so I went there. He said, don't be acting like them that don't know God. That no one should take advantage of or defraud, defraud his brother in this matter. He says, don't defraud, don't, don't take advantage of your brother. Don't, don't get to a point where you just will do any and everything for your personal gain. He's saying, don't do that. Don't cover covetous. Don't be covetous of what your brother have. Now, the context here is sexual immorality. So what he's saying, brothers, what he's saying, sisters, is don't get caught in adultery. What he's saying is, is, is don't take advantage of opportunities that you have. What he's saying, my brothers and my sisters, he's saying that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. What matter? Sexual immorality. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such. The Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarn you and testify. He's saying, we're the one that warned you. We're the one that told you don't do it. We're the one that taught you the right way to go. But we're not the Avengers. God is. <laughs> That's why God says, God says to us, don't, don't, don't try to go and get back at folk. He says, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. And let me tell you, God can deal with them better than we can. Right. Let me tell you, if anybody can deal with them, God can deal with them. He says to us, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. What such? <laughs> that stuff there, that sexual immorality, as we also forewarn you and testify. In other words, don't take advantage of opportunities that you have mm -hmm. to sin. Verse 7, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. God has called us. We, God, we like to quote scripture. God has called us out of the darkness into the marvelous night. If God has called us out of darkness into the marvelous light, don't keep going back there. Don't keep going. God has not called us to uncleanness or uncleanliness. God has not called us to uncleanness. We need to make sure that we stay clean. Back home, men, men used to warn young boys, keep it clean, man. They would, they would pat you on the back and say, I'm watching you, keep it clean. God has called us not to uncleanness, but to holiness. And, and this word holy means that, that we've been called to keep it clean. We, we've been called to be different, to, to be set up fire. Let me just share with you, it's not easy. But he says it's possible. Whatever God commands us to do, it is possible to make it happen. He says, for God do not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Verse number eight. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God. 
he who rejects this, he who don't agree with this, he who do not carry this out, he who does not obey these commandments, he does not reject man, but he rejects God. He rejects the almighty God. He rejects God. But God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. I told you he was going to talk about it. We have the first, first few verses, he talks about God the Father. Then he moves, in verse number two, he says, the Lord Jesus, and verse number one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, as I told you, in verse number eight, he says, the Holy Spirit is in us. And how did the Holy Spirit, he gets in, get in us? Because God, who has given us his Holy Spirit, there it is, the Trinity, the Trinity, the Trinity itself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three persons in one working for one common good. That is to keep us holy, keep us sanctified, keep us set apart. And nobody can do it like God can. Let me just share with you today. You can't keep yourself holy. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many degrees you get. I don't care if you read the Bible night and day. I don't care if, I don't care if you quote scripture all the time. You cannot keep yourself holy. I don't care if you grew up in the church. I don't care if your daddy was the chairman of deacons. Let me tell you, you cannot keep yourself holy. It takes the Holy Spirit to keep you holy. It takes God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, to keep you holy. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one, work together to keep us holy. They work together as one unit. They work together because they are one unit. They work together to keep us holy. Amen. You see, when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a, it, is, it is not a new feeling. It is not a new pouring out. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is sometimes taken out of content because this feeling of the Holy Spirit is not really feeling. It is activating. Mm -hmm. If we allow the Holy Spirit to be activated in our lives, if we allow him to be activated in our lives, if we allow him to guide, to lead our lives, then we're already filled. Matter of fact, we're filled when the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit comes in when Jesus Christ comes in. And if we allow him to be activated in us, we, we, we can walk in purity. We can walk in sanctification. We can walk in righteousness. We cannot do it on our own. I tried it. Can't do it. I don't care. I don't care what it is. Today, I went by the store. I went by the store today. And I picked up two different size moon pies. I went by the store. I picked up chocolate moon pies. I had a, a chocolate moon pie that that big. And I had some chocolate moon pies that are a little smaller, about that big. And I picked up a box of big moon pies that had three in it. Then I picked up a box of, of small moon pies that had six in it. And I looked at the, the label on it. And what I wanted to see is which one will give me the most oop for my money. So I looked at the box that had the small moon pies in it. It had six in it. The one with the big moon pies in it only had three in it. But the one with the three in it had more ounces to it. So even though I wanted the small ones to eat every now and then, I got the big ones because it gave me more of what I like. And when I got home, I opened the boxes up. I opened both boxes at one time. Boy, Daddy would kill me if he knew it. I, I opened both boxes at the same time because Daddy said, don't open all that stuff at the same time because you eat it all in one setting. Opened both boxes at the same time, and I poured them in the dish while Sister Davis was looking the other way. 
And lo and behold, she went to the trash can, and this time she looked over in there. <laughs> and when she looked over in there, she's like, where are they? Where are they? I, I didn't know any of those were here. And lo and behold, she went over there and got one of the small ones. And those were the ones that I was trying to keep for myself. So now after this session, I got to go back and eat a big one. Because she ate a small one. In other words, the temptation is always around us. And I can't help myself. But God can. God can fix it for us. And if we are wallowing in sin, God can fix it. If we are tempted on every hand, God can fix it. If we, if we get the big ones or the small ones or, or the big lie or the small lie or the little white one or the, the big black one, it doesn't matter what sin you're wrestling with. Here he talks about sexual sin. All of us wrestle with something. And many of you, let me just tell you, let me just look you right in the eye and tell you, many of you don't wrestle from sexual sin or sexual immorality because you got too old to do it. It's not because you, you have been filled with the precious Holy Ghost and, and born again and sanctified. And the others of you that are not wrestling with it, it's because ain't nobody led you in that area for a long time. But yeah, we can be pure. We can walk with God. We cannot hinder, cannot stop ourselves on our own. Paul ends this pericope up in verse number eight by saying, God has, has enabled us by way of the Holy Spirit to resist ourselves. Let me tell you, we ought to be praying, Lord, bless me and deliver me from me. Because it's hard for us to resist ourselves. Tonight is sexual immorality. Other times it's bad attitudes. Other times it's rebellion. Other times it's lying. Other times it's stealing. Other times it's cheating on your taxes. Other times it's cussing your children out. Other times it's, it's faking the insurance. You see, none of this can we keep ourselves from because I go back to let you know we are controlled by the passions of our lust. As Paul points out here in verse number four, we are controlled by the passions of our lust. He says don't give in to it because, final verse here, verse eight, because God has given us his Holy Spirit. And that's why we sing that song. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. He keeps me. And if God doesn't keep you, you can't be kept. If God does not keep you from sin, any kind of sin, you can't be kept. Remember tonight, God has given us his Holy Spirit, he dwells in us, he keeps us, he leads us, if we allow him to. There may be somebody here tonight that have not trusted Jesus to lead you. This is your moment. You can come to Jesus just as you are. You can't deal with sanctification until you deal with with salvation. And if you deal with sanctification and walk rightly before the Lord, he's going to bless you. He's going to keep you. Temptation is all around us. And the devil only tempts us in those areas that we are attracted to, that we have passions of lust. I say to you today that God can fix that. But you got to try him. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Come to Jesus just as you are. Come to him. He can make it right for you. Come to him. He can make a difference. The door of the church is open. 
if you've never received Jesus Christ, I want you just to repeat after me and invite him into your life. Say these words, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer, believing that Jesus died and rose again, we believe that you're now saved. You're on your way to heaven. You have salvation. You have justification. And we also believe that you can have sanctification. There may be others of you who, who have salvation, but you've just fallen short in the area of sanctification. You have not lived a holy life. Will, will you allow me to pray with you and pray for you? Better yet, will you allow me to pray for us? <laughs> Since we all have fallen short, we've all sinned. Lord Jesus, we come now thanking you for the privilege of depending on you. Now, Lord, we ask you to deliver us from our sins, from, from our passions of lust, from our thoughts that are not right before the Lord. Bless us to live holy lives. Sanctify us. Bless us to be set apart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. There may be others of you who have not been to church in a long time and you're in between church homes or you don't have a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. If you want to join our church, please inbox me and let, let, let me know. and I'll be glad to get with you and welcome you to this great family of faith in Southeast Houston. You don't have to be in Houston to be a part of our church. You can, just as you're listening tonight, you can, you can come and join our church, be a part. And whenever you're in the Houston area, you can come by and visit with us. We just want you to get to know Jesus through the teaching and preaching of the New Beginning Church. If you just want to be connected, inbox me and let me know. I'll show you how to be connected to the New Beginning Church. We believe that this is a great church in the Lord, so we welcome you. We're not perfect people, and we're not looking forward to perfect members, but we love the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please, ma'am, follow up with us next week as we continue in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It is now offering time. It is now time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sanctification. Tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. You can give by two means. You can give through Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail your offering and your tithes in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Four five nine. We'll be glad to to be with you and, and join you in giving unto the Lord. Again, thank you tonight for for joining us for Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night in Bible study at seven fifteen p.m. So thank you for being here tonight. Also, join us on Sunday morning at nine a.m. for our Sunday school. Our Sunday school is at nine a.m. every Sunday morning 9 a.m. Please join us this same station. Also join us for our worship service 
our worship service is at 1030 every Sunday morning. Our worship service is 1030 every Sunday morning. Please join us. You can come by the church. We're back in church. You can come by. We're, we're safe and we're distancing ourselves. We're taking temperatures. Please come by and join us at 1030 a.m. on Sunday morning. We look forward to seeing you and being with you and and serving the Lord with you and celebrating the great conquering king of Calvary at the New Beginning Church. Uh, report cards and recognitions of graduates are upon us. We want to get, we want you to give your report card in, get it in to me. I need your report card. I need to be praying over your report card. And also we'll be recognizing you on second Sunday, second Sunday in June, we'll be recognizing all the graduates and and we'll be bragging on those of you who have matriculated through school. We're excited about what you're doing. We're excited about uh, what you're going through in your schoolwork. Also, uh, I have one report card before me. I want to recognize Brother Gilbert Garza. Brother Gilbert Garza, I have your report card. Thank you so much. I get your gift to you as soon as I can. Uh, make sure that you get your little brother or your big brother or somebody to to get his report card in. Looking forward to everybody's report card. We want to make sure we recognize you. Gilbert, you're the first one, so you're the first one that gets a gift. If you sent your report card to me and I didn't give it, let, get it, or didn't announce it, let me know, let me know, and then I end up giving two, three gifts away. But thank you so much, Gilbert, for being the first one to get your report card in to me. God bless you and God keep you. Looking forward to everybody else's. I guess I gotta turn my report card in this year also. Got to turn my report card in. I don't know who I'm a, who gonna be giving me money, but but I turn mine in also. Amen. Thank the Lord for 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 what He is doing, and and such a great work He's doing in our young people's lives. Uh, we are pay, praying for Kayla Kincaid. We're praying for Kayla Kincaid. Praying that God heals and touch and gives favor. We're praying for Katie Smith. Praying for her health. We're praying that God continue to bless her. Praying for my mom-in-law. Uh, Sister Lorraine Orr, we're praying for God's strength and help and, and her conditions during the times like these. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for those whose name we've called and for those names we have not called. We ask you to bless in the name of Jesus. Heal and touch as only you can. Bless the bereaved. Bless us as we go through times like these. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a strength and hope. We thank you, Lord, for delivering us from this, this COVID-19 virus. We thank you, Lord, for flattening the curve. We know that no one could do it but you, and we thank you. We thank you, Father God. We ask you to give strength and help to those who are sick. We ask you, Father God, to give deliverance to those who are wondering. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless our church. Keep us and bless us, Father God, to always look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Bless those who have given. Bless those who will give. We pray that you continue to walk with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you, as Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 32. God keep you. Please come back and join us again.